So this could be a term that you have heard in the past, or this could be a completely new, brand new phenomenon, like who the heck is Iambic and what are they doing in my living room? But fear not, because we are going to be going into the nitty gritty of what this elusive nonsense is, so that you can go away from this little video with an understanding of what Iambic pentameter is, how do you recognize it, what do you do with it, and the common pitfalls to avoid. Oh, and if you're new here, hey, I'm Louise. I help people who are auditioning for drama school get the offers of their dreams and I also help professional actors maintain their skills and develop a sturdy audition practice so that they are getting jobs again and again and again. So stick around, subscribe to the channel so that you can watch more videos of my face. It'll be worth it. Excellent stuff. So let's get straight into what is iambic pentameter. In a very basic sense, iambic pentameter is the rhythm and meter structure that is used in verse text, in speeches and scenes and sonnets, mostly in classical texts like Shakespeare. We usually associate it with Shakespeare because he was a little bit of a sucker for the old iambic pentameter. So in the land of classical texts, you have verse and prose. Verse has a rhythm structure and prose doesn't. Prose is just kind of free and casual, no rules, anything goes, and you can see it on the page like this. The verse is a lot more structured. At a glance, it looks just like poetry, which is kind of the point because that's exactly what it is. It's regimented, it's neat, it's tidy, and it kind of looks like the sentences are broken up over several lines just like this. Okay, so let's break it down. Verse comes in lots of different forms, but for the classical text that actors will be working with, iambic pentameter rules the roost. So we are gonna focus purely on that. Iambic refers to the rhythm. Pentameter refers to the meter. So let's start with the iambic part. This refers to the foot of the meter. So if you are listening to a song or a piece of music, you will acknowledge that there is a rhythm to it. Now, lots of different songs have lots of different rhythms. So you might have a bit of this, You might have a bit of this. Or a bit of this. Now an I am is a foot with two syllables in it. The first syllable is unstressed and the second syllable is stressed. Kind of like when you say your own name or somebody else's name that has more than one syllable in it, you know that there is gonna be one syllable that is more stressed than the other. Oscar, Penelope, David, Haley. And in the circumstance of an I am, it sounds like this, D-dum. So that hand is unstressed, and this hand is stressed, D-dum, D-dum unstressed, stressed. Now please note that this is not dum d mm -mm. D-dum, yes. Unstressed first, followed by a stress. So now that we've got that, keep that in your brain, we move on to pentameter. This is the meter of the verse, i.e. the meter of pentameter. Now this is basically how many rhythm feet, how many I ams, are in a standard line of text. Now the word penta comes from the Greek and it means Five. Now here's where we start to do some Shakespeare maths. Shakespeare maths. Penta means five, and an I am has two syllables within it. So you are going to have five I ams in a standard line of text. And because an I am has two syllables, you are going to have, as part of a standard line of classical text, 10 syllables in each line. I am two times penta five, two times five, 10. Shakespeare maths. And then you're going to alternate unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. So it will sound a little something like this. D-dum, 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 D-dum. And this is why verse looks so different on the page to prose, because prose does not subscribe to any rhythm structure. Iambic pentameter does, which is why it is structured like this on the page. Now, by the way, if you are there thinking, what the frickin' heck is this? Hold the frickin' phone. This is difficult and hard. I am an actor. I am not a mathematician. I want to have a nap. I want to go home. I want to turn the car around and not have any ice cream. That's you. It is a learning curve for sure, but you can totally get to grips with this. And once you do, you're gonna find that it's actually gonna work to your advantage. But if you think that you need an extra little helping hand and some guidance, then get in touch. I offer one-to-one -one coaching with actors all over the world. And one of the big things that we work on when we're working on classical text is the rhythm. So if you're interested, you can book a free 20 minute strategy call with me. All the details are in the description box below so that you can kickstart your coaching journey get those skills and feel so much more confident working on classical texts 
and walking into an audition room. So if we're gonna take everything that we've just learned and actually implement it on a piece of text, let's take this one, for example. This is from Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, when I read it, please note that you are going to hear the iambic very, very clearly in my voice. I am not saying that this is the way that it's supposed to be performed. More on that a little bit later on. Okay, here we go. How happy some o other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of this Demetrius thinks not so? He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs doting on Hermia's eyes, so I admiring of his qualities. Things base and vile folding no quantity. Love can transpose to form and dignity. So all of these lines are true or regular lines of iambic pentata, meaning that every single line has a total of 10 syllables per line. But you can also get irregular lines. So lines that have eight, nine, 11, or even 12 syllables to them. This is not a mistake. Shakespeare did not just spontaneously go mad. I mean, he might have, I don't know him. We need to think about the purpose of why the lines are irregular or regular. And because this is not a mistake, it's actually a clue. It's a clue in how you could be developing your character on how you could be seeing the scene. It is a creative tool. And that's one of the big things that I see as a huge mistake when actors first start working with classical text is that they stick to the rule so, so rigidly that they actually abandon all understanding of why it's like that in the first place. That they are viewing it purely from this technical point of view. Instead, we need to look at the rhythm as a possibility for making creative choices. So if the speech has loads of irregular lines, loads of eights, nines, elevens and twelves, this could be an indication that your character is experiencing some kind of emotional turmoil or there's an emotional climax that's happening, that they're confused or frustrated or upset or enraged by something, or even that they're going mad. There's lots of insanity in Shakespeare. Or ghosts, he loves a ghost. And another thing that you'll notice with classical text is that Mr. Shakespeare puts no stage directions other than people exiting and entering. So everything that is happening within the text, everything that the character is going through, is actually there within the words, the punctuation, and the rhythm structure. It was very clever. So for lines that are under 10 syllables, so your eights and nines, this could be a little demonstration of a cheeky little dramatic pause. So if say it's de dum de dum de dum de dum, you've got another de dum to have a big old dramatic pause. How fun. Okay, so by now you're starting to think, ah, there's loads of creative possibilities with this text. Excellent stuff. But how can I further make creative choices based purely on the evidence within the rhythm? Great question. Well done. So let's return to our extract from Midsummer Night's Dream. So the first line, how happy some or other some can be. Now the word happy has two syllables, standard. And you know that the ha part of happy is the stressed part. And that fits perfectly within the iambic pentameter. Totally standard stuff, nothing to write home about. But then you've got the word some and the word other. Now these are comparison words, and that's the whole point of this speech. Helena is talking about the fact that she is in love with the same person that Hermia is in love with, and that they are constantly compared and Helena always falls short. So the word some and other, how happy some or other some can be, the comparison is really, really evident. That is something to strengthen your argument as the character. Because you've got this lot of people over here, the some people, and then you've got the other people over here. Some or other some can be. So by actually comparing them, by stressing those words, the comparison is heightened and therefore the injustice that Helena is experiencing is heightened as well. So the same with the second line. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. I and she are also stressed according to the iambic pentameter. So again, you can use the pronouns by stressing them, you're heightening your argument. Now, at no point am I saying that you should be stressing every single word that is actually stressed within the iambic, because then all that's gonna happen is you're going to fall into the de dum de dum de dum thing, which sounds fucking rotten. So this is where you start to use your own analysis skills, your imagination, your creative way of thinking to actually figure out, okay, I've got all of this evidence here, I've got all of these things to play with, what do I want to do? Okay, so here are the common pitfalls of what I see when people either first start working with Shakespeare or have been working with classical text for a while, but they are still falling into these things. And it sounds 
and appears absolutely awful. So please don't do these things. Punching the rhythm. So kind of like when I first read the extract from Midsummer Night's Dream, that idea of it just sounding like de-dum, 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 just with different words. Because you don't want it to sound once more onto the bridge, dear friends, once more. Do you know why? because no human being talks like that. Remember, the rhythm is a tool, a creative tool for you to use. It is not a rule, it's not a ball and chain to sink to the bottom of a river with. Because at the end of the day, you are using this text to embody a character, to experience a situation and to affect another person. And believe me, no person is gonna be affected by what you say if you were just going, de dum de dum de dum Because at the end of the day, you just sound like a robot. And the only time that we're gonna be affected by a robot is when they take over the world. So use the rhythm, yes, but do not fall to the mercy of the rhythm. Not honoring the punctuation. <laughs> Okay, so let's take this text from King Lear. Okay, so you can see that these lines are a combination of regular ten syllable lines and some that are irregular as well, but it's all iambic pentameter. But what you can also see is the lack of punctuation at the ends of the lines. There's no commas, no full stops, no question marks, none of that. So this is called enjambment. It's a fancy word. It basically means that if there's no punctuation at the end of a line of classical iambic pentameter text, then you follow it on, you run it on to the next line so that it actually makes sense. And you only stop when you actually hit some punctuation. Okay, so if you don't honour the enjambment, if you don't honour the fact that there is or is not punctuation within the text and only follow the iambic blindly, then it's going to sound a little something like this. Thy nature art my goddess to thy law. My services are bound, wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines, lag of a brother, why bastard, wherefore base? You see how that sounded shit? <laughs> because it cuts off the meaning of the thought. If you are pausing at places that have absolutely nothing to do with the end of a thought, the meaning of the thought, then you are going to lose the meaning altogether. But if you do this instead, thy nature art my goddess. To thy law, my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me for that I am some 12 or 14 moonshines lag of a brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base? Doesn't that sound a lot better? Reciting or doing Shakespeare. <laughs> I've always got to mention this one because damn does it come up a lot and it is an absolute car crash when it does. Actors for some reason convince themselves that because they believe that they are doing poetry that it has to sound like poetry. It has to sound all poetic and dramatic and Laurence Olivier-ish. Great actor but yes of his time and these days we actually want it to sound like it's coming organically from you as if it is modern day text but this is the words that you are choosing to articulate yourself in the moment because if you treat it like poetry it sounds shit so there we go hopefully you've got a better understanding of what iambic pentameter is what you can use it for what not to do with it how to recognize it how to break it down all of that good stuff. And like I said before, if classical text is something that you struggle a little bit with, then get in touch. We can totally work on that in coaching because it is something that is used in drama schools, for auditions and in a professional capacity. So it's something that you will likely come up against anyway. So you might as well get good at it. And as always, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos with me. And I shall see you in the next one. But for now, 